The first year I applied to graduate medicine, I was honestly baffed. I'd got a high 2-1 biomed degree from the University of Oxbridge Rejections and a fifth decile UCAT. Essentially, I thought I was a big man. After getting slapped with four pre-interview rejections, I knew I'd done something wrong. The thing is, everything you hear about this course is like, it's so hard to get onto, it's so hard to study on once you're actually on there. It's like, bruv, it's nonsense. When you read papers about medical school on sort of Google Scholar, they talk about the attrition rate, the number of people that drop out of medical school once they've enrolled. Now, once you actually enroll on one of these graduate medicine courses, like the number of people that don't become doctors in the end is so small. Once you're in, the likelihood is that you'll probably complete it and you'll become a doctor. And it's my view that once people are properly informed about how to get into a medical school, um, actually getting in is not a big deal either. So in my second year of applying, I targeted four graduate medical schools. I got four interviews um, and converted two of them into offers. And realistically, the two things that made all the difference in my ultimately successful graduate medicine applications were UCAT prep and interview prep. So UCAT prep, so this process literally bought me four interviews. If there's a goal from the initial application stage is to get as many interviews as possible to give yourself the best chance. So personally for the UCAT, I did about four months of revision, a tiny bit each day. Um, I ended up banging a 2960 band one. So because I looked at the statistics from the freedom of information requests, I knew that my score 2960 was above the lowest candidate from the year before at every single medical school I was applying to. So having got my four pre-interview rejections the year before, I knew how important the UCAT was to my graduate medicine future. And literally once they gave me my printout with my score on it, I knew that was probably gonna be four interviews. And then I knew statistically my chances of getting an offer off the back of one of those interviews was way higher. So the question is, how should you prepare for the UCAT so you can give yourself the best chance? Well, because I flopped the UCAT in the first year that I took it and then obviously did quite well. The second year, I feel like I'm quite well placed to tell you um, of the different strategies that I that I used from first year to second year and what worked for me personally. So the first year I did two weeks of prep. I bought this textbook, um, get into medical school. Yeah, 1,250 questions. Um, yeah, I mean, there's probably some good information in there, but that didn't work for me in the slightest. When I got to that Pearson View test center, I was like, running out of time on every single section. Uh, I knew I'd flunked it. Honestly, I knew I'd flunked it straight away. Second year, I was like, right, let me approach this intentionally. Let me do some deliberate practice uh, and try and improve my score considerably. So the first thing I did was around May. So around now, I bought a Medify subscription for like three or four months. So looking on their website, the prices have definitely gone up since I took it. But if I was taking it this year, I'd get the four month subscription for 120 pounds. So yeah, 30 quid a month, although it's expensive now, this is the thing that really really made the difference in terms of my score that second year. So I definitely recommend getting it. And after I'd got the subscription, I spent a bit of time faffing around on these video tutorials. It says they've got 50 hours of video tutorials. To be honest, I'd just sack that completely off and just start immediately doing the timed questions. So from day one, I picked two topics, so verbal reasoning and abstract reasoning or something, and I just bang out sort of 30 questions on each timed. So do a set of questions timed. But once I've done my set of sort of 20 or 30 timed questions, I'd go back through every single answer and I checked both that I got the reasoning right for the ones that I got right and you know why I got the reasoning wrong for the ones that I put wrong. So I'd end up going back through every single question that I'd taken, created a tab in my OneNote entitled UCAT wrongs or wrong answers from the UCAT and for all the questions that I got the reasoning incorrect I'd take a screenshot of that question plus the answer, I'd drag it across to that OneNote tab. Through this process I'm creating a bank of questions that I'm specifically struggling with um, and thereby I'm sort of honing in on my weaknesses. Every now and then I'd review that set of questions that I'd created um, and eventually you just stop getting those types of questions wrong um, and your score just improves and improves. I think it's really important that you start doing timed questions as soon as possible, as soon as you get the question banks. This is gonna start building your intuition with regards to timing. And essentially, yeah, just work through as many questions as you can. Just I just banged out the whole question bank when I was revising. Like. For abstract reasoning, I went through the whole question bank twice. It was quite low stress doing abstract reasoning puzzles. Like, there's only a certain number of patterns out there. And if you've seen all the ones on Medify, like go through this Medify question bank, you're looking out for sort of prime number sequences, square number sequences. They always used to catch me out. So when I got into the actual exam, I was like, 
Wow, these are so big. A lot of people have messaged me off the back of my first UCAT video saying that that really worked for them and it dragged their score up. And for me personally, yeah, I got 860 in that section. I never thought of myself as some sort of abstract reasoning, some sort of shapes whiz. It was that score, it was the score in abstract reasoning that dragged my total score over the threshold for sort of Newcastle and Southampton uh, and eventually ended up getting me into medical school. So it's always good to see if we can find a research paper that is backing up some of this anecdotal evidence we're chatting about. So this was a very widely referenced paper on how to do better in aptitude tests. So in this meta-analysis they found that students can raise their scores on aptitude tests by taking practice forms of the test. So I think the most important realization from this paper is point number two. So what they found was that the more practice tests that people did, the better they actually performed. So taking the learnings from this paper, I think as a proxy for practice tests, we can say, um, you know, time pressured sets of questions on Medify the more time pressured sets of questions we do on Medify, the better our score is gonna be when we do come to take the UCAT. So towards the end of my revision period, around sort of July, I went onto the official UCAT website, I went down to practice tests, and then I just banged all of these four practice tests out twice. <laughs> but yeah, this time I went a bit more freaky with it, so. Um... <laughs> So I'm always of the view that if you're preparing for a test, you should try and simulate the conditions that you're gonna be under um, as closely as possible. So they have those sort of big ass uh, Windows computers with the external keyboard, the beat up mouse. You know, there's a Donny next to you coughing, he's got a cold, he's sniffing in your ear canal um, while you're trying to take this test. These are the kind of things that can throw you off if you're not prepared for them in the actual exam. And obviously, once again, once I'd finished all these questions, I'd go back through every single one and check that I'd got the reasoning right for, for that particular question. If I got it wrong, make a note of it in my sort of wrong answers section. So that's effectively how I prepared for the UCAT. The only thing left to do is to go in there and take it um, and not get thrown off by the sort of pressure of the environment. There's a few things that helped me. Um, I made a video about it. No one's watched it, but it's, I honestly think it's so good. But yeah, those things might help you too. The next thing I did was prepare well for my interviews. So really the goal of the interview and everything I was reading on Google Scholar, like the goal of the interview is to assess the personal qualities um, that are important for being a doctor. But they want to see that you have the soft skills that are important for being a doctor and I've identified eight key ones. Communication skills, teamwork, self-motivation, resilience, coping with pressure, leadership, empathy and integrity. So when I was preparing for my interviews, I had created a story around each of these things. So this was a story of a time when I'd both seen it in practice and a time that I'd personally shown that thing. I then reflected on the story, I'd thought about what I'd learnt, um, what I did poorly, what they did poorly or what they did well. And I'd also thought about why these are specifically important for being a doctor. So once I'd got my story written down, I'd then um, go onto a voice note on my phone and just practice it out loud. Yeah, it's a little bit cringy saying things out loud. Like when, when I revise, I always speak things out loud and my housemates always just give me heat for it for some reason. So particularly for interviews, what we wanna try and do is simulate the environment and simulate the pressure that we're gonna be under. So we're gonna to have to say these out loud at some point. I feel like a voice note is, is a really good way of simulating the pressure. I've actually just written a small guide that goes through these eight key personality traits in a bit more detail and goes through a specific template that um, will hopefully help you create sort of compelling and slick stories for your interviews. Yeah, although it's not interview season yet and people are probably just starting to think about applying for sort of 2023, 2024 grad med. It definitely pays to start early with these things and start constructing your stories around work experiences that you're having sort of now or in the next few months so that stories are more organic, they're more genuine um, and you're not just coming up with them on the fly the day before. I sat on the panel last year and interviewed some people for grad med and you can tell who has prepared well and who's sort of making things up on the fly. So aside from this bit of preparation, the other thing to do is get solid on your why medicine and why this particular uni. There were sort of three things that I hit in my preparation. So the first thing was I thought of something personal to me about the city that the university was in. So Newcastle, for example, uh, my granddad grew up there. Um, I went to Durham, obviously, so I'm familiar with the Northeast. The second thing was something unique about the course itself. So yeah, taking the example of Newcastle Graduate Medicine again, you know, it's a small course, it takes graduates from from a range of disciplines so you don't just have to have done sort of biomedical sciences like the, like the biomed mandem and the combination of the fact that it's it's a small group learning and the fact that you've got people with different academic interests it's going to create interesting discussions because people are going to have different points of view um, and it's going to be an interesting environment to learn
learning. The third thing I'd do is just have a little fish around for um, what sort of research is going on at that particular medical school. You know, I'd pick a bit of research that I found interesting and then, you know, in the interview I'd just make them aware that I knew about this research that was going on and that was something that I w might be particularly interested to get involved with. And those were the two things, so off the back of that I got two offers and two rejections, but we won't talk about the two rejections obviously because I'm trying to put forth uh, an air of confidence and clarity. And with that I was off to med school and it's crazy to think that four years has gone by already um, and the next stage is activated where just trying to enjoy life and become a competent happy um, healthy adult I guess um, and have a fulfilled career and life so to sum up what I've said if I was to boil graduate medicine success down to two things it would be if you bang the UCAT and apply strategically you can win the maximum number of interviews possible four out of four which has got to be the ultimate goal at the initial stage then prepare thoroughly and intensely for your interviews creating stories around the personality traits you need to anticipate uni and course specific questions and crucially practice speaking these out loud and that is it subscribe to get me to 1000 subscribers and I'll see you in the next one